was the American war, not our war. Canada was involved, big time, in a big way. In the 1950s, North America boomed. Cars, new appliances, and television sets were transforming the popular landscape. In Canada, the influence of life south of the border was pervasive. American music, movies, pop culture icons. Along with all of this, the evolving politics of the Cold War. To a substantial degree, in one form or another, socialism has spread the shadow of human regimentation over most of the nations of the earth. And the shadow is encroaching upon our own liberty. Somewhere along the line, this must be blocked. It must be blocked now. In 1954, Vietnam is divided. In the north, Ho Chi Minh's communists hold power. In the south, an autocratic regime increasingly supported by the United States. We are attempting to help Vietnam uh, maintain its independence and not fall under the domination of the communists. Canada's official role in Vietnam involves membership on the International Control Commission, or ICC, a neutral body overseeing the uneasy truce between North and South. By 1964, fearing their ally in South Vietnam will collapse, America is on the precipice of full-scale war. To leave Vietnam to its fate would shake the confidence of all these people in the value of an American commitment. With the truce undermined, Canada finds itself playing both neutral observer and American ally, peacekeeper and arms dealer. Canada is not officially at war, but for thousands of young Canadian men, Vietnam becomes a place to fight and die. My intention was to join the US Army with the sole goal of going to Vietnam. You know, I had looked at the Canadian military, but again, I didn't feel like spending three, five years in barracks. For many Canadian men in the 1960s, the Army promises a job, adventure, and honor. And no Army captures the imagination like the American Army. The American way of life sort of intrigued me, that they were pretty tough. The soldiers were good soldiers, and I wanted to be one of them. I wanted to be somebody. Ever since I was about five or six years old, I always wanted to be a Marine. So uh, 17 years old, I, I kind of quit school, and uh, I wasn't doing much of anything, so that's when I decided to join the United States Marine Corps. From all across Canada, thousands of young men head south to volunteer. With the war in Vietnam escalating, they are welcomed by American recruitment officers and fast-tracked into service. 
young men would go down, they'd be given a letter of acceptance from the Pentagon, they'd come back. The American consulates or the American embassy in Canada would then grant them a visa and a promise of citizenship. We know that anywhere between 10 and 40,000 Canadians enlisted in the American armed forces. Considering Canada was not an active participant in Vietnam, that was a considerable number. While we didn't encourage it, we didn't uh, take offense at it because after all, people are uh, free to do what they like. And if they felt that strongly, why, uh, there was, was really none of our business. I believe that the, the Americans were right. Uh, I believed in the, you know, the stop, stopping the spread of communism. And... Communism was bad. Communism was no good for anybody. Communism had to be stopped no matter what the price. That's the, um, the feeling we went over there with. They thought the war was just, they went to fight. Others thought it was a kind of a big game of cowboys and Indians. And I was looking forward to the excitement, the thrill, the adventure. Unlike those who travel south to volunteer, Les Brown lives in California. Although still a Canadian citizen, he finds himself facing the American draft. I had made plans to leave the country and, and return to Canada. Um, but uh, the closer I got to my induction date, the, uh, I lost my resolve. And uh, for reasons I still don't understand, I, uh, I waited for the draft date to come, and, and in fact it did. And then the next thing I knew, I was in the jungles carrying an M16. While the U.S. Army has many missions in many lands, the attention of our nation is focused inevitably on Army activities in one particular part of the world, Vietnam. You know, it never entered my mind was the phrase, it's not my war. Never, not once. No, it was my war because I volunteered. Nobody forced me to go. We were like them gong ho, but most of uh, the young people were just drafted eh, where we were volunteers and we were crusaders. <laughs> Their name for us was crusaders. I had a nickname called Canuck. They used to call me Canuck. So I had something to prove for Canada that I, I was going to be a good soldier for you guys. I'm not going to let you guys down. You know, really, this was in my mind. I could make you proud dad, you know. Being a Canadian, I, like I said, I probably could have said, no, I'm not going, I'm going back to Canada, and you go on with your little war and do whatever. But I made a three-year commitment. If being in the Vietnam War was part of being a Marine, then that's what I was going to do. I wasn't about to back out on that. Communist forces in Vietnam include the National Liberation Front, or Viet Cong, as well as regulars of the North Vietnamese Army. They are motivated by a strong sense of nationalism, galvanized by decades of fighting foreign occupation. The Viet Cong is physically tough, uh, mentally courageous. He gets an awful lot of mileage out of minimum resources. He can endure an awful lot of hardship. He's cunning. He's an enemy to be respected. We believe our cause. Uh, Vietnam is a small country and a very small amounts of weapon compared with America. It was the whole country, you know, ready to go to war against the Americans. Here in Hanoi, you can see at the weekend on Sunday, hundreds of thousands of young men pour into the street, shouting slogan against the American invasion of Vietnam, and they were ready to go to the front. 
We are fighting for our, our independence and also freedom. The question of Vietnam being divided and reunified is a question of the Vietnamese. It should be settled by the Vietnamese, not with the presence or the intervention of American or foreign troops. It was always it was spooky, uh, obviously, being inserted into an area where you hadn't been before and you weren't familiar with, and, and you didn't know uh, who was there and how many of them. Lightly armed, communist forces make use of small improvised munitions placed in the way of their enemy. Well, all the training you have and all that is how to use weapons, how to defend yourself you know, how to escape and evade and, and all these other things. But nobody tells you that when you arrive in country that every single place that you're at is dangerous. You had to watch every step you took over there, and I mean every single step. The Viet Cong laid landmines, booby traps, punji pits all over that country. Booby traps are booby traps. Win some, lose some. The first person I seen die was a, um, a person in, one, in, one, in our platoon that I was attached to. He uh, went down a hill to get some water out of a stream and he grabbed onto a tree branch and the Viet Cong had placed a grenade up in the tree. And as he grabbed onto the tree branch, the grenade came swinging down and hit him in the stomach. He died in such a way that he was unrecognizable as a human being. But the kids were the indicator of what was going on. If, if the kids were hanging around you and were near you and they were smiling and yelling, for some reason they they knew what the hell was going on. But if you didn't see any kids, then the hair on your back would sort of go up. And then all of a sudden, it was the highest you ever been. There's no dope could put you that high. You'd be so high, terrified. You get into a firefight, you start shooting. It's them or you, you put that in your mind. If you don't kill them, they're gonna kill you or they're gonna kill your buddies. There's nothing as exciting as a firefight. You know, surviving a firefight, with the bullets whizzing all around you. And you know, I went my past without even knowing it. I distinctly recall uh, at one point where I, I, I realized that uh, I was going to die in Vietnam because there were just so many ways of uh, being wasted that survival didn't seem possible. After long days of patrolling in the jungle, soldiers set up camp in the evening. While some sleep, others keep watch on the perimeter. The nights over there seemed a lot blacker than they were on this side of the world. I mean, literally, you could literally put your hand in front of your face an inch away and not be able to see it. You're damp, you're cold, you're hungry, you're lonely, you're scared. And, and all the elements sort of catch up to you. They're, they're all surrounding you, and, and you're trying to fight them off, but you lose. Bushes start to look like people. 
trees start to look like people. That's the worst time. Uh, you know, we used to say the nighttime belongs to the gooks. Charlie owns the night. He did, he owned the night. Encamped in the dark on Hill 22, named for its elevation in meters, Monty Coles recalls a sudden attack on their position. The first two lines of defense fall rapidly. And then the third line of defense was around the command post, which is where we held them. And at that point, it became hand-to-hand -hand combat. Somewhere in the fight, I lost my rifle. I was using it like a baseball bat at one point, and I lost it. It got to the point where you were grabbing the enemy by their heads and breaking their necks. Uh, one particular uh, fella, I grabbed him by the throat and yanked his throat out. And you were smashing heads with rocks, stabbing people with bayonets. Literally, anything you could get your hands on. As fast as you kill one, there was another one there to take his place. And this was going on all over the hill. Just a constant, constant battle for three or four hours. And once the battle is over and you realize you're alive, that's when you collapse. Along with troops on the ground, a massive air war is launched against communist targets. I don't know whether we can describe it. I mean, it's awful. Mm -hmm. It's terrifying. Uh, they call it carpet bombing. You know, three kilometers wide and uh, five kilometers uh, uh, length. You can't run away. There's no way you can run away from the B-52. It was very painful. For the first time, you had to bury your friend. That happened again and again and again in the six years we lived in the jungle. Every time, the feeling was just the same. The war effort requires a constant supply of firepower. Back in North America, Canada is well positioned to meet the rising demand. CBC journalist Knowlton Nash recalls the business behind Vietnam. Canadian industry certainly contributed an awful lot to, uh, to the United States in terms of the military buildup and the, and the materiel for use in Vietnam. There's no doubt about that. We shipped down enormous amounts of uh, nickel and ore and uh, bullets and planes and other ammunition. We were entirely integrated with NORAD into the American arsenal. And essentially what we did is supply parts. Well, the policy was non-participation. Now, that didn't mean that we didn't sell the Americans uh, material, because we did. I wouldn't say we, we were happy with the, uh, with the situation, but at the same time, we took their money. While Canadian industry booms, sustained American bombing of North Vietnam also draws Canadian criticism. The Canadian government often raise concerns about the barbarity of the American war not the prosecution of the war itself, but its barbarity. In April of 1965, Prime Minister Lester Pearson speaks at Temple University in Philadelphia. He praises the American war. He says that it is a, a war that is, uh, it's not imperialist, it's, a, it's a, a just war. But he asks a question which is extremely 
um, discomforting to the American president in particular. And he says, would it not be possible to stop the bombing temporarily to see what the North Vietnamese response will be? And Johnson just lit into him. They had a very chilly lunch, and then he took him out onto a terrace after uh, the luncheon and uh, began to give him what was known as a Johnson treatment. He was grabbing his lapels, shouting at him, whispering at him, putting his nose right into Mr. Pearson's nose. Pearson thereafter knows never to broach the subject again. This, I think, marks a moment when Canada and the United States start to deviate in general approach to the war. I think in Vietnam, most Ameri senior American military officers feel that Canada is a bunch of freeloading, hypocritical loudmouths preaching peace and yet freeloading off the war by selling military supplies to them. They just cannot understand why we're not joining them in this holy war crusade against this faceless communism in South Vietnam. There were segments of the society that demanded that we join the war. And were those who wanted us to break with the United States. The politically active group in Canada. Students and young people and, and intellectuals were by far overwhelmingly opposed to the war and, and it was their presence really that was being felt. At the time, Simon de Young and Judy Pocock are students in Vancouver and Toronto. But there was a shift in consciousness. And a lot of different factors came into play. And certainly the war in Vietnam was a big one, a very big one. I mean, pretty early on it became apparent uh, that it was, you know, a terrible, terrible war. It wasn't the business of the United States to, in to interfere. It was a civil war. Canadian complicity becomes a key rallying point for the peace movement north of the border. We sold $2 billion worth of weapons for the prosecution of the war. We allowed the Americans to practice carpet bombing over Canadian skies. We tested the dreaded Agent Orange in Gagetown, New Brunswick. It was only later, of course, that we found out that it was a very dangerous chemical and the after effects of years and decades later. But uh, at the time it was just presented as, uh, as something routine, like, well, I'm going to spray my garden with this and it'll kill all the dandelions, you see? So, well, okay. Jet engines, bomb casings, explosives, green berets, food and beverages, cartridges, monitoring systems, Trucks, tank parts, bullets, napalm. There was probably a Canadian part in every single American weapon. In 1966, despite two years of battle, American firepower fails to bring a decisive victory. For the civilian population caught in the crossfire, the costs of an escalating war are tremendous. Villages suspected of supporting communists are targeted. It is evident everywhere I go in Vietnam that the American fighting man of this war is the best trained soldier we have ever put into the field. He can enter a village from which he has been fired upon, destroy a route to Viet Cong, and then show compassion for the families left behind. And you'd enter along these paths or trails, uh, evenly spaced out, like uh, not, too, not too close together, uh, weapons at ready, uh, ready for just about anything that may occur. We would come into that, and we would just gather, go from hutch to hutch, 
knock over everything, look for weapons, look for uh, any kind of contraband. If you found hidden uh, caches of food, rice, whatever, you usually burned it to deny the enemy the use of it. There is a soon-to-be VC. This entire area has been under VC control for many years, and uh, we consider every suspect to be VC. Then we would, at times, burn their huts, destroy the village, and so on. Fighting soldiers from the sky, fearless men who jump and die, men who mean just what they say. We felt personally that it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't warranted, you know. But we carried it on reluctantly, and, uh, under protest, as you would say. One hundred men will test today, but only three. thing I think I, that really bothers me the most about it though is the civilians, the Vietnamese civilians, the, what they're having to put up with. They're the ones that are really coming out on the short end of the whole thing, the way I can say. And some of these people didn't do us any harm at all, so we started creating enemies right there. I looked up and spotted um, just a, it was an MVA, he had a green uniform, had an AK, and uh, I was like a you know quick draw old thing. I opened up in him, he opened up in me. If you got ambushed from the tree line, uh, nine times out of ten, you'd call him what we call the fast movers. In the background, you can hear this roar coming, and you know it's the fast movers coming in. You know they're coming in with some hot stuff. You know once they leave you're not gonna have no more problem because they annihilate everything in that tree line. Very, very spooky, loud. We could feel the heat from the, from the, uh, the napalm as it exploded. The jungle would literally shudder as these fast movers came in and dropped their loads on target. So just an uh, incredible display of firepower. Canadians go into battle with maple leaves drawn on their helmets and stitched to their American uniforms. Widely dispersed throughout the large U.S. Army, most serve unaware of their own numbers. I never thought there was any Canadians over there, you know, like, I guess I'm the only one. I never even thought about it, uh, but I've never met any. We thought we were the only one, and as it turns out, we, we weren't. Nolden Nash travels to Vietnam in 1967 as a journalist with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. But you just run into them accidentally. I'd run into a, a few of them uh, in the course of just prowling around the Saigon or prowling, or I'm off on a patrol. You suddenly find a guy from Moose Jaw or a guy from Montreal or something of that kind. His attitude was not really very much different from that of his colleagues. Uh, they, were, uh, they were almost a band of brothers. As far as the Americans were concerned, we were one of them. We did get the, uh, the odd ribbing about being Canadian. We were forced to come here. Why are you here, you know? But they accepted us, you know? They thought it was a great thing for, for us to be there. What happens is uh, the guys that you're serving with become your family. I wrote to my 
family and my girlfriend and friends uh, with the thinking that if you didn't write letters, you wouldn't receive them. And nothing you know, cheers a soldier up more than, than a letter from home. Well, I see by your letter you're getting some good weather up there now. The weather over here is really being hot. As long as you can get a letter from home, you're still in touch with the real world. Even though you're in a, an insane situation, you're still in touch with the real world. Through the day, you're out in a hot sun. That wears you down after a while. And later on in the war, I managed to get a hold of a uh, small portable tape recorder. So I'd send my family tapes instead of letters. I'll, uh, I'll say goodbye for now. Give my love to the kids, to everyone else. Right. Large American bases provide sanctuary from a dangerous life in the field. Canadian veteran Charles Dowell is stationed at Camp Davies near Saigon. Our camp had every facility you could think of. We had a movie theater, a swimming pool, we had a movie theater, we had bars on camp. It was just like being in a stage. We head to Saigon. There's a street called Tudor Street in Saigon. And that's uh, Paris of the East. There's anything you want on Tudor Street. If you want it, it's on that street. Bar girls, they were uh, interesting things. <laughs> they were there for one thing. Maybe there was a lull in, in fighting or a lull in bombing or whatever, and it, and it was just quiet, quiet and peaceful. And you could sit back and say, man, this is a beautiful country. It's really, really nice. It was like going back 300 years and, and watching these people do their thing. Everything was, um, like, everything was made out of wood. And then, of course, the mortars would start flying again, and that vision went out the window. <laughs> American strategy does not aim to hold territory. Instead, enemy body counts become a common measure for gauging success. Military statistics are viewed with skepticism by a press corps enjoying unfettered access to the battlefield. Knowlton Nash recalls the daily briefings in Saigon in 1967. Uh, it was called the Five O'Clock Follies, and the reason it was called the Five O'Clock Follies was that it was essentially a spin uh, operation. You quickly came to be skeptical of what the officials were saying uh, because they were lying. You would go out into the field, you'd see something happening, uh, and you'd come back, and you'd hear a description of what was happening. And it was totally at variance with everything you saw with your own eyes. It does seem fair to say, though, that the Americans are winning this war, in the sense that they and the South Vietnamese are killing more of their enemy than they are having killed. 
and they are gradually and painfully extending their area of control. At the present rate, however, it will be many years, if ever, before you could think of the whole country as being secure. Knowlton Nash, CBC News in Vietnam. By going out on patrol with these guys, spending nights with them, and, uh, and being as scared as they are when they're into a firefight of some kind, that's when you learn what uh, a decision taken uh, in a boardroom is, uh, what the consequences of it are. For soldiers carrying out American strategy, intense battles for small parcels of land that are soon abandoned wears on morale. It was a hilltop. It was yours for that day. If you moved off at that day, as soon as you were gone, the Viet Cong moved in and took it over. And you go back the next week, you take that hilltop back off them again. Stay there for a couple more days, you'd move off, they'd take it back over again. At the beginning, we thought we were going to we were there for a purpose, but as the time f went by and the year, the months went by, we sensed there was no relief, there was no gaining on anything. In South Vietnam's highlands, American paratroopers begin a routine assault on a remote hill named 875. Unexpectedly, they walk directly into a fortress of communist tunnels and bunkers. An entire company of paratroopers is wiped out. Two others are trapped. George Post is with the 2nd Battalion, fighting its way up the hillside to provide relief to the encircled troops. We got there at 4 in the afternoon. Uh, we started to see a lot of bodies, uh, mostly American, of course, and there was quite a few Vietnamese. They started to bomb us. And a lot of people who were re wounded got wounded again and killed and so on. An offensive up the hill falls short. And as night looms, soldiers retreat and wait for dawn. The hill is covered with the dead and wounded. The mood is desperate. It just hits you all of a sudden and it's black. It's daylight and then it's black. Everything clouds over. Dead bodies and pieces of blood and screams and everything. We got back down to the area and nobody said much. We smoked a couple of cigarettes. We all stayed to ourselves. Some were saying their rosaries, some were saying prayers. <laughs> the hill was shaking like a, a jello mold. That's how much they would put the artillery on there. You couldn't hear nobody. It was so intense that there was no color. It was smoke, fire, it was black and gray. November 23rd, Thanksgiving Day. With American dead and wounded numbering close to a thousand, a push for the summit begins. Surprisingly, it takes only 20 minutes. The North Vietnamese have abandoned the hill, carrying off most of their casualties. When we got there, we thought we had won the whole war, you know, that we were gonna find stacks and stacks, but that wasn't the case. We found a lot of broken uh, weaponry, and but their enemy, the, the, they had carried them off. About lunch hour, we had turkey flown in. Thanksgiving day, they brought in containers full of turkey, ice cream, and uh, you name it, they brought it up. I said, here, enjoy it, you deserve it. Stay cool, and they gave me this ice cream. And I have never ate out chocolate ice cream since then. <laughs> The battle for Hill 875 is proclaimed a victory. Very soon after, it is abandoned.
when you end up losing one of the guys, it, it hits you pretty hard, really, really hard. Uh, the first guy I lost, I, I broke down in tears. I just, I just couldn't handle it. After you've lost uh, friends, you, uh, you, you tend to remain distant and not want to bond. Yeah, once you befriend somebody, you, you lose them. Uh, it hurts more than if, uh, if you weren't their friend. If they're still alive and then they die on you, you try to make them comfortable and, and let them know somebody gave a damn of what they did over there. The majority of us, we just felt like nobody gives a damn, so we cared about each other. So I held a guy that died one night, and you know his last words were "Mama." So anyway. After nearly three years of war, there are close to a half million U.S. troops in Vietnam. More are on the way. No matter how many thousands and hundreds of thousands of troops you put in there, you always seem to need more. And I think that's what began to question, why the, when the media began to question what was happening, when the public began to question what was happening. In late 1967, there is talk of light at the end of the tunnel. However, for the public back home watching the war on television, that light is about to go out. Tet, the Vietnamese New Year. Coinciding with a declared holiday truce, a massive surprise offensive is launched by communist forces. One morning, all hell broke loose. The enemy very deceitfully has taken advantage of the Tet Truce in order to uh, create max, maximum consternation. While the world watches, the American embassy in Saigon is occupied, then recaptured. The cultural center of Hue falls. Literally overnight, every city, town, and American base in the south comes under fierce attack. Then they attacked our base, and they were coming on with satchel charges, blowing up the helicopters and the helipad. And then they were going after the hospitals. And, you know, they were lobbing rockets in, and they were doing all kinds of nasty stuff. And uh, we saw them close up. They were 50 yards away, coming at you, and realized you got to kill him, or he's going to kill you. Because you're looking right into somebody's face, and you're blowing them away. It, it's not very pleasant. After weeks of intense combat, the communist offensive gives up all of its early gains. Although a military failure for North Vietnam, it secures an important coup 10,000 miles away on the American home front. It brought forward in a very graphic way, um, television screens and, and newspaper coverage and the like, um, that maybe the Americans could lose. To say that we are closer to victory today is to believe in the face of the evidence, the optimists who have been wrong in the past. To suggest we are on the edge of defeat is to yield to unreasonable pessimism. To say that we are mired in stalemate seems the only realistic, if unsatisfactory, conclusion. But it is increasingly clear to this reporter that the only rational way out then will be to negotiate, not as victors, but as an honorable people who lived up to their pledge to defend democracy and did the best they could. Remember Lyndon Johnson was quoted as saying that if he'd lost Walter Cronkite, he's lost everybody. And uh, this was a real factor in his judgment about leaving. I shall not seek 
and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. In 1968, a growing peace movement back in the United States takes center stage. Disillusionment and rising American casualties swell the ranks of angry protesters demanding an end to the war. In Canada, demonstrations are staged outside the American consulate and on university campuses across the country. We organize meetings and sit-ins and lovin's and lions across railway tracks to stop the Canadian railways delivering the, the napalm or the TNT. And people wrote letters to their MPs and some ran for Parliament. We feel that uh, Canada's government uh, is very much involved in the war in Vietnam and supporting the Vietnam diplomatically and through armed shipments to the United States. They had a case for it. They said the, the, What's the difference between being there and providing arms? And uh, you have to draw the line and say, well, there is a difference because uh, it's not our war and, uh, and we're not involved directly. Yes, of course there's a major difference between supplying arms and being there. Uh, being there means that you put yourself out for it. Uh, supplying arms means that you're, you're an arms supplier. I'm really quite astonished. Former cabinet minister Mitchell Sharp. It would have been sold anyway, oh yes. They had demands for, for uh, munitions, uh, <laughs> for activities all over the world. But we have this uh, understanding, this relationship with the United States, and we can't just cut them off uh, because we don't agree that, uh, that they should be over there. You can almost say that uh, being the arms supplier might be even the more reprehensible uh, because you're, you're profiting on other people's deaths. It was the American war, not our war. And it, you know, you, you, you ask, why do we continue to have, uh, uh, to treat the Americans as the allies? <laughs> because they are. It was the beginning of doublespeak. Either we abided by the terms of the Geneva Agreement, or we didn't. We relayed information, in some ways maybe threats, implicit threats, to the North Vietnamese, and were seen as, as go-betweens in some ways, with clearly an American agenda. Canadian diplomats spied for the CIA. Canadian members of the ICC also. I think that the distinction was we were non-participants, strongly, but not neutral. And there is a distinction. I would flip that around. I think we should have been neutral because we were part of the observing team. And certainly, you know, we weren't not involved because through our, our contracts in the, with the defense industry, how the defense industry in North America is sort of just totally intertwined and our military is intertwined, I think on many levels we were involved. Along with public protest, activists strive to put a human face on the war's distant enemy. Representatives from North Vietnam are provided with public platforms on Canadian university campuses. We don't have aircraft to bomb the United States of America. We don't have enough palm to drop over the children, the schools, and universities in the United States of America. Who are the Americans in South Vietnam? Half a million GIs who are killing our people there. So don't we have to fight? Don't we have the right to defend ourselves? to kill the American and their henchmen. 
Even as protest rises, the war continues to draw young Canadian men to the American Armed Forces. John Gordon Radcliffe volunteers in 1968. My friends thought I was crazy, most of them. My, my, of course, my mother was upset. And my father um, didn't like the idea, but he himself had volunteered for the Second World War, and so there wasn't very much he could say about that, specifically because uh, there is a sense in which I was following in his footsteps. In the United States, a growing number of young men refuse to serve in the military. Tens of thousands of them travel north, seeking sanctuary in Canada. Canada ultimately represented the only viable solution to me at the time. Canada made its position reasonably clear, uh, very clear in accepting draft dodgers, uh, which personally meant a lot. <laughs> Uh, the fact that there were industrial ties to the war was unfortunate. We got the cream, in a sense, of, of a whole generation of Americans. We got young people that were articulate, that were bright, that were sensitive, that were good people who didn't want to go out and kill. At that time, you knew about Trudeau because he had just come into office. And you knew about um, his more progressive uh, thinking I mean, he was not your usual uh, politician. He was not your usual American politician. He was not Richard Nixon. <laughs> Elected on a platform promising peace with honor, Richard Nixon wages war for another three years. Let us be united for peace. Let us also be united against defeat. Because let us understand, North Vietnam cannot defeat or humiliate the United States. Only Americans can do that. Seeking a decisive blow to bring North Vietnam to the negotiating table on American terms, Nixon continues intense bombing. In 1970, he extends the battlefield to neighboring Cambodia. It's hard on all of us. I know we're all tired of this. <laughs> tired. You want to get back to Vietnam? Uh, I never thought I'd be saying that either. I want to go to Vietnam for a change instead of staying in Cambodia. The beat goes on. The beat goes on. Keep pounding a rhythm to the brain. La da 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 dee. La da 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 da. Charleston was once the rage of home. With talk of a gradual American withdrawal there is a growing sense of betrayal among soldiers still in the field. The government wasn't fighting the war to win, and they eventually that filters down through the troops who are saying, you know, what are we doing this for? We had the elements against us. We had the VC, we had the NVA, and we had the South Vietnamese people who didn't like us, didn't want us over there anyway. And then we had people at home getting on our case. We all became very reluctant warriors. We didn't, there was, a, it's, we had a sense that the war was winding down and uh, nobody wanted to be the last grunt to die in Vietnam. New draftees bring with them the anti-war sentiment from home. Battle is frequently avoided. Drug use is on the rise. Everybody in Vietnam had to have a crutch. A lot of the uh, older servicemen, soldiers, whatever, had alcohol. Another one was uh, religion. A lot of people got closer to their God. And then, of course, there was marijuana. 
Marijuana was so easy to get and such high quality and so cheap. I mean, I, I don't think I spent any money at all on there except 50 cents on a pack of tailor-made joints. It is. This is really nice stuff over here. So good. <laughs> I make it down here maybe twice a day. Sometimes in the morning I'll come down here, sometimes in the afternoon. Then we really get it on in the evening up there at the fire base. They fought with no purpose, without bringing any benefit to them. If they died, they viewed that death as useless. Thus that showed them the reality of war, the reality of death, of injury, of eating dirt, of sleeping under dew and everything at the battlefield. From that, they started to have thoughts. They thought, who are they fighting for? For Les Brown, the futility of the war leads to a personal act of defiance. In 1970, while still in the field, he puts down his machine gun. I did, in fact, uh, turn in my weapon and apply for conscientious objector status. I, I, I felt a total sense of betrayal and hopelessness. I felt betrayed by the U.S. Army, by the government, by the whole world, really. I didn't want to die in Vietnam. The average tour of duty in Vietnam lasts one year. Counting down the days is a soldier ritual. When you knew you were coming to the end of your tour, the closer you got to that, the more excited you became. When you climb on that plane, which we learned to call the Freedom Bird because you were flying home to freedom. Probably the greatest feeling you'll ever know. Because as, as that plane lifts off the ground, you look back and you see the earth moving away from you, and you know you're on your way home. of announcing that we today have concluded an agreement to end the war and bring peace with honor in Vietnam and in Southeast Asia. By the early 1970s, the anti-war sentiment of the protest movement has engulfed middle America. The war effort no longer has public support. All American forces will be withdrawn from South Vietnam. The people of South Vietnam have been guaranteed the right to determine their own future without outside interference. In January of 1973, a truce marks the end of American involvement. The South Vietnamese Army, left on its own, is no match for the North. In 1975, Saigon falls, and Vietnam is united under the leadership in Hanoi. For young men returning home, the transition from soldier to civilian is rapid and disorienting. After life in a combat zone, a shower and clean clothing does little to ease a mind hardwired for survival. Monty Coles returns to Montreal. In the slightest noise, you're instantly awake and ready for action. And I mean instantly. The first night I came home, my mother came in to wake me up next morning, not realizing what she was doing. She came over and shook my shoulder, and I come up out of that bed and I almost killed her. A good two months after that, she'd stand back and wake me up with a broomstick.
past 36 hours from time that I left Vietnam to standing in London. And they give me clean clothes, but I still had the smell of the, the jungle on me. So that was fast. Just mind boggling, confusing, uh, hard to understand. You know, guys would sit down for that meal with their family and still have mud under their fingernails from Vietnam. I arrived there, I was 19, and uh, I came home a couple of years later, and I felt like I was 35. You know, it, it's just amazing what combat will do to you. A lot of us uh, have been to a very dark place that uh, I'm not sure you completely come home from. I think the most horrible memory, and then it's bad. It, it wakes me up at night. There was no action in the area for weeks and weeks, and we were just on a regular routine patrol. And uh, this little girl comes out of the village, must have been three or four, cute as a button, just waving and laughing and coming towards me. And she went off the trail a little bit, and she stepped on a mine. Pieces of flesh flew at me. She was innocent, she wasn't a soldier. She wasn't fighting any bloody war with anybody. That was the worst, the absolute, absolute worst. And I, I hope it goes away. Along with the trauma of battle, there is an additional burden for Canadian veterans. Not only is the lost war unpopular, it is also an American war. They weren't drafted, they went there out of their own choice. Well, it's a person you want to talk to, you want to have words with. Why did you go? You know, what, what, what's going on here? And I, I'm probably going to use some words here people don't like, but I had this long-haired, hippie creep come up to me, spit on me and call me a baby killer. To this day, I don't know why I didn't beat him. I really don't. They would be seen similar to the way veterans were seen in, in the United States, even worse, as if somehow they were suckered, that they were stupid. And that's our, our Canadian smugness, I would say. Now, we got all the, call, call all the names the Americans did, but then we were also called mercenaries, hired killers. I quickly learned to become a closet vet because there was no meaningful dialogue going on between those that went and those that didn't go. We, we couldn't help each other. In the U.S., there's a good chance there's somebody in the area has either been to Nam or been in the military during that time because everybody was basically being drafted. Canadians didn't have that to fall back on when they got home. But I was starting to really feel flashbacks, and, and I hadn't talked to anybody about Vietnam because I didn't think anybody understood, anybody cared, so I kept my mouth shut. I was really feeling bad, and I felt I got to get around other veterans. Looking for fraternity, Mike Gilhooly visits a Quebec branch of the Royal Canadian Legion. As a veteran of a foreign war, he does not qualify for membership. And instead of understanding, he is greeted with animosity. Well, why would anybody want to just volunteer for a war that we weren't involved in? Um, that's something that a lot of people couldn't perceive as being um, a right thing to do. Through newspaper ads and word of mouth, veterans of Vietnam gradually seek one another out. Surprised by their own numbers, they soon form discussion groups and associations in every major Canadian city. Wanting a resting place for their own memorial, the veterans are turned away by Ottawa. The city of Windsor, Ontario eventually steps forward to provide them with land. But for many, there is still a longing for formal recognition on a national level. I'd like to see the Canadian government supply and install a national memorial for the Canadians served in Vietnam. We have memorials for World War I, World War II, Korea. Hey, whether they like it or not, its citizens served in Vietnam. 
why should we honor them? I'm not downplaying their sacrifice, but they weren't sacrificing for Canada. They were fighting in a foreign war. They were fighting in a foreign uniform. Let's say that they went and joined the Vietnamese forces. Would we uh, recognize them? Why not? Canada, after all, so did, was supposed to have played a neutral role. And uh, for us to, to now give some honor or some recognition for those Canadians who fought for another country in another war, um, I, I don't think would make much sense. And I don't think the Canadian public would support that either. Vietnam today is a thriving, independent nation. Yet the refuse of a long, brutal conflict still disfigures the landscape. Stark memorials to the more than one million Vietnamese who lost their lives. For Canada, 30 years and 10,000 miles from the scarred battlefield, there remain the lingering ghosts of an American war. There never was a real debate in this country saying this $2 billion in weapons gives us wealth. Choose. We're on this commission as an American ally. Here are the consequences if we don't. Choose. They never did. And then they made billions of dollars off the war in Vietnam and, and they claimed this silent complicity that, oh no, we never had any, we never supported that war. Well, you made money off it. That's support. Maybe we had a kind of schizophrenia about it. Uh, we loved to make the money and uh, loved to have our uh, high moral horse at the same time. While on the one hand we want a positive image, we want an image of Canada as a peace-loving nation, it's also important for us to know when we don't do that. Well, it's a very difficult to earn international trust as a true peacekeeper. And uh, you take side. Mm -hmm. And when you take side, you know, in international effort like this, it's very difficult to be a peacemaker. Canada was involved, big time, in a big way. You can't get away from that. How do we explain to the Canadians why we did what we did? Uh, what motivated us? Are we any different than our fathers were? No. I, I did what, what the time wanted me to do and what I was motivated to do and what I believed in. Everybody was doing sort of what they thought was right at the time and, uh, and then later dealing with the consequences. People can call me all the names they want. They can, they can brand me as a mercenary, a hard killer. I don't care. I'm very, very proud to have done what I did. 